Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Economic Outlook webinar, uh, Navigating Turbulence. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, get things kicked off here this evening. We may have a few more join. It looks like uh, folks are joining um, on Zoom, and we appreciate you doing that. And uh, also, uh, we have folks, I believe, um, coming in on Facebook Live. So that's great. Uh, thank you for being here with us. My name is Matt Hearn. I'm with Cannon Wealth Management, and uh, I'm one of the partners here. Also, um, uh, work with clients and um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, focused on the financial planning side of things. But we have lots of questions right now about the markets and the economy, and uh, are we in recession? I'm sure, I'm sure many of you have heard that word recently, if you've been paying attention to the news. Um, but we are excited to to introduce uh, our, our guest this evening. Uh, we have James Kelly with us. And James is part of the portfolio analysis and consulting team that provides portfolio research and uh, construction um, uh, consultation to wealth advisors like, like ourselves, uh, using an array of qualitative insights and quantitative tools. Wow, that's a mouthful, James. Uh, <laughs> prior to joining the Texas, um, and uh, we've We've, we've joked here in our firm about the name, Natixas. It's a little bit hard to say, but um, James was a financial advisor on a high net worth wealth management team at Oppenheimer. And um, he is also a CFA, a charter holder, a CFP professional, and a chartered alternative investment analyst. He has a Series 7 and a Series 6 licensed. And uh, that means you're really smart, right? Uh, <laughs> it means... Uh... I took some time to get some alphabet soup on my, my business card, but thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I think you're getting married soon. Is that right? That's right. On Saturday, taking the plunge. So okay. busy time, yeah. but I'm excited. <laughs> well, welcome. I, I, I took the plunge uh, about 13 months ago. So 13 months ago in two days. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's great, man. You you just, just, just uh, try not to cry too much. When <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you guys doing it? Are you on the beach or what are your plans? So we're getting married in Newport, Rhode Island, and there's a, a little spot kind of on the harbor that we found. So uh, hopefully right. the weather will hold. Looks like it's going to. So we're, we're excited for sure. Good, good. Do, do it upright. That's great. Yeah. And tell me about Natixis. Who is Natixis? Maybe sure. some of our folks haven't heard of them. Yeah, sure. So um, you probably wouldn't have heard of Natixis because we're a, an asset manager who's, who's based actually out of Paris, but our headquarters in the U.S. is in Boston, which is where I'm located. And we're a, a, what we call a multi-affiliate asset manager, meaning we have many different money managers who are affiliates um, that do a lot of different things, whether it's equities or fixed income or alternatives. Um, and so, you know, we have mutual funds and separate accounts and things like that, different investment vehicles. And what I work where I work is in our solutions department. So we're responsible more for helping advisors um, in building portfolios, figuring out where to invest, really more so um, how to make the experience for their clients uh, the best that it can be. Absolutely. And I can attest to the fact that you guys have been really helpful as we've worked together. Of course, we're an independent shop here and we work together with uh, our clients and all, of course, and uh, many different asset managers and, and firms that we bring to the table that we believe are a good fit for our clients. Um, of course, we have a fiduciary responsibility to monitor those portfolios. And, and uh, you know, if, they, if you don't perform well, we'll fire you. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, that's so, so far so good with you guys. You guys have really, really done well for us. We appreciate all the help and all the partnership. Um, so let's dive right in. A couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, Kimberly Stone is in the background taking care of all the, uh, the question and answer. Uh, she would love to get your questions throughout the webinar. So if you have a question, you can, you can post that in the Q&A section in, in Zoom. Or if you're on Facebook Live or watching this uh, maybe after the fact, feel free to email uh, us at, um, at info at canon-wealth.com. And we'll have that on the screen for you here in a little bit. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, and I'll share my screen with you. Let me do that right now. All right. Let 
Okay, and uh, hopefully um, you can see the screen there and looks like everything's working okay. So we'll dive right in and I'm gonna just move this down where I can see it. Here we go. And we'll, we'll uh, tackle these slides and hopefully you'll find this helpful. A lot of, lot of data points. We're going to talk about the economy, talk about the stock market, talk about the bond market, talk about our outlook for the end of this year, as well as 2023 some. So, uh, so hang on tight. We're going to go fast. Uh, markets rarely give us clear skies. They're all, always threats to watch for on the horizon. But the right preparation, context, and support can help us navigate anything that may lie ahead. So far this year, uh, hasn't seen a full-blown crisis like 2008, 2009, or or 2020, but the ride has been very bumpy. Uh, we might not, we may not be flying into a storm, but there's been plenty of turbulence the first part of 2022. Uh, how businesses, households, and central banks steer through the rough air will set the tone for markets over the second half of 2022. Are there enough analogies in that first little part of the <laughs> for, for you? We've talked about clear skies, threats on the horizon, uh, navigating in, uh, you know, storms, uh, turbulence. So um, we, 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 uh, we're stretching the analogy, but, um, you know, I was thinking about the last time I was on a plane and, uh, and, and, you know, you got turbulence, right? You got, you got the bumpy ride of the, of the plane ride there. And, um, you know, there's two kinds of people. There's the folks who uh, pretend to be asleep during the turbulence. Uh, and there's the folks that, that just pretend to be reading, right? I mean, that seemed like the two kinds of people. And I know both types are pretending uh, because in, in turbulence, it's impossible to do either one. <laughs> um, and I just want to look around and, and scream at everybody and say, well, somebody just acknowledge that our butts just fell a thousand feet <laughs> in, in a second, you know. Um, but people just act like it's no big deal. It's, it's just part of the ride. Uh, imagine if we took that same attitude when we talked about or thought about investing. Uh, the reason why no one seems to care about the turbulence in an airplane ride is because why? Uh, I mean, we know that we're going to get to the other side, right? We know we're eventually going to land this plane and we're going to be safe. Um, and yet when we're investing, sometimes we forget that. Uh, the reality is uh, every single time in the past that uh, investors have been properly diversified, they have been able to make it safely through these economic downturns. Um, every recession, every market correction, properly diversified portfolios have, have weathered the storm. So, um, but why don't we have that same confidence? Uh, I, I wonder, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm stretching the analogy, but uh, it certainly is something to think about. Um, so moving on here to the economy, let's talk a few minutes about the economy. Uh, the markets are emotional because they reflect what? They reflect the actions of emotional creatures, uh, AKA humans. <laughs> uh, but the markets are also rational over longer periods of time because they reflect the economic cycle, or at least they loosely reflect the economic cycle. The economic cycle reflects the business cycle. So what do we think about the economy in general? Uh, economic growth will likely downshift in the later half of 2022, uh, reflecting a slowdown in real spending as a consequence of elevated persistent inflation. Recession risks are increasing, but our, our, our base case is that there will be no recession this year uh, as consumers, particularly upper income or middle to upper income uh, consumers can, can sustain spending patterns from in, income growth, excessive, excessive savings from post-pandemic years um, and uh, revolving consumer credit. We actually believe the domestic economy will grow this year even though we've seen two back-to-back -back negative quarters of GDP. First quarter down 1.6% year over year, and the second quarter down 0.9%. Uh, we think the ec economy still has sufficient momentum to offset the current inflationary pressures. For example, in the fourth quarter of 2021, we saw 6.9% year over year increase in GDP. And in the third quarter of 2021, we were up 2.3%. So we were coming off of a pretty strong year in 2021. Our base case forecast includes an inflation rate that moderates as supply bottlenecks improve and we potentially get some clarity regarding the Russian war with Ukraine. Our most likely scenario is that the economy avoids a recession as forecasted growth still surpasses 2% in 2022 with another downshift 
to under 2% in 2023. James, I'm curious what Natixis is saying about recession and are we currently in a recession? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, if you've been watching the news or, or, or uh, really sort of listening to anything, um, you know, you've heard differing opinions there, right? So one of the generally accepted definitions of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth. And we had that, right? The first quarter and the second quarter were both negative. But the, the important thing to, to sort of remember there is one, that's real GDP. And if you were to um, look at nominal GDP, which is adding inflation back to that, um, you know, we're still in pretty high nominal GDP type territory, high single digits year over year. Now, that doesn't mean that the experience for the, the average person maybe isn't a little bit worse because of inflation and what's happening. And certainly we can't sustain these very high levels of inflation forever. But, um, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you think about nominal GDP, that's what business revenues and therefore earnings are, are, are um, recorded in. And so that's what actually really typically matters more for things like the stock market. So on, on the one hand, yes, it's not great for certain parts of the economy, but on the other hand, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing for the stock market. And I would also say that when I think about a recession, you know, I think that um, most people equate it to whether or not they have a job, right? And if we look at the jobs market, it's still very strong. We're adding, you know, we added 500,000 jobs last month. Um, the employment market is still very tight. It's hard to find people. And so I think it's hard to make a case that we're in a recession when we still have very strong consumer spending. Unemployment is still basically at all time lows. Yes, GDP was negative, but actually, if you sort of peel back the onion, it was more due to a couple uh, specific things. So what we're looking at on the screen right here is this um, uh, trade deficit or surplus, depending on, on whether you're uh, importing or exporting more. Um, and as we came into this year, the U.S. Con consumer was still very strong. Um, and that was reflected in the fact that we were importing a lot of goods from around the world. Uh, on, on the other side of the ledger, the rest of the world, you know, Europe's dealing with, with a war in Ukraine um, and a, a bit of a, an economic slowdown. And then a country like China, which actually imports a lot from, from the U.S., for example, was basically in lockdown. And when you have something like that happen, you end up with a negative or, or a trade deficit. And that's one of the components of GDP. And that weighed heavily on, on the GDP prints, especially in the first quarter. Um, so that's not necessarily a reflection of, of a weak economy here, right? It was more so that we were so strong on the consumption side that uh, the, the trade deficit component of GDP was negative. And so that, that can, can bring it down slightly. You can see on the charts here um, that we sort of turned down um, in the most recent prints. Um, so the other, so if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, some of the other parts of the world were, were weaker. And so they weren't, they weren't necessarily buying our goods um, at the same level that they have been in the past. Um, and yet we were, we were importing um, quite a bit. And so that, that kind of skewed the numbers. Yeah, exactly. And so when, when we talk about GDP growth, if we're looking year over year, or quarter over quarter, it's made up of a number of different things. You have consumption, um, you have production, you have government spending, and one of them is also the, the trade deficit or surplus. And so if we are exporting more than we're importing, then that adds to GDP growth. And if we're importing more than we're exporting, then that actually takes away from it. But it's not necessarily more of like an accounting thing than it is a reflection of the strength of the economy. Gotcha. Um, and I, I think you have a slide on the inventories, Matt, which is the other component of this. Yeah. So um, another piece of GDP, and I know this is getting down in the weeds, but it's important to understand that without these, these two things, the trade deficit being negative and uh, inventories also coming down, those two things is what really pushed us into negative GDP territory. It wasn't due to spending or consumption. And so if you if you look here, I know it's kind of a busy chart, but essentially what this is showing you is those this spike up in those purple bars on the right, that's um, companies loading up on inventories in 2021 in response to pandemic sort of revenge spending, right? Nobody could spend anything in, in 2020. And then everyone came out and they wanted to buy stuff and, and companies didn't, didn't have it um, or they couldn't get it because of the supply chain. So they way over ordered. And then there was a shift in consumption behavior by, by the US consumer from goods to services. And so what you had was these companies like Walmart or, or a Target are just way overstocked with inventory. And so the, the, the inventory purchases have come down. And that's where you see those purple bars kind of coming down and then that blue bar dropping. 
that has a negative impact on GDP. So it's not, again, not due to spending patterns or necessarily the strength of the, of the economy. It's just a almost like an accounting uh, um, you know, impact on GDP that the change in inventories coming down is what sort of pushed us into negative territory. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, it sounds like we're we're come you know as we're coming out of this pandemic and and uh, folks are trying to get back to somewhat of a normal uh, lifestyle. Um, there's just ebbs and flows in different parts of the economy. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I would say that you know when you go through something like a global pandemic, there's going to be some extremes, right? When when we were in the midst of it in 2020, early 2021, companies didn't know what to do. So a lot of them just sort of you know. Um, uh, projected that they were going to have to have less stuff. People were going to not buy as much. We had government stimulus payments. We had a just a very resilient consumer. And so that created this shortfall. And then companies had to come in and try to get as much as they could. Supply chains made it hard to get that. If we look at other um, measures of, let's say, economic strength or growth, or you know, we could call it a, another way of looking at sort of um, GDP, um, which if you look at these, these graphs on the left, uh, that first set of bars is real GDP, and you can see that um, over time, and that's what it's showing you, the purple is back in March of 2021, over time, it kind of came down, right? And so the orange and yellow bar represents 2022. We had negative real GDP. We just, you know, that's why people say, oh, are we in a recession? But if you actually look at things like um, sales, so sales to domestic purchasers, that's that middle set of bars, um, that remained fairly robust, right? Um, same thing with uh, Final, final sales to private domestic purchasers. These are these are more indicators of um, uh, consumption patterns and what people are buying, or in this case, what 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 purchasers are, are selling. Um, and the chart all the way over on the right here. This goes back to the discussion of real versus nominal GDP. If you if you include inflation, so the the increase in prices on goods, you can see that we remained very robust. So GDP was still up in the sort of mid to high single digits and, and people are still spending money and buying things. Absolutely. So I know that uh, if you go to any restaurant or you try to get on an airplane right now, you can see that people are certainly, certainly spending money, certainly moving around the country. Um, uh, total retail and food credit card spending. I think this is an interesting slide and, and uh, hopefully folks can see it okay. Yeah. So what this is basically showing us is that um, even despite the inflation we've been dealing with, um, we've stayed at, at fairly robust levels of, of spending, right? So we've, now some of this maybe is due to, to higher prices sort of flowing through, but I think you know, what, what you see is that over time, um, the, the left side of the chart is the big drop off in COVID, right? And then we can not kind of snap back very quickly. Um, during, during the pandemic, everybody was stuck at home, right? And there was this, this big shift over to buying goods. So instead of going on a trip somewhere or, or, or paying for some kind of service that was closed down, people were on Amazon or buying an Xbox or something like that to keep themselves busy. And we saw this, this massive uh, pickup there. By the way, that's one of the reasons why that trade deficit shifted in, into where we were importing more because rather than you know going to Disney World, people were buying an Xbox made in China, right? And so you had that, you had that big shift. We're now seeing the reverse of that. Um, and people are starting to shift back more towards services, which should uh, help on the inflation side, right? As you have less demand for goods and, and more for services. But what this is telling you right here is that, um, you know, despite what we might see in the, the GDP prints, spending and, con and consumption is still strong. And the U.S. economy is something like 65 to 70% driven by, by consumption. So that's really what matters most. Yeah, yeah. I heard, I, I read somewhere or heard somewhere that um, a lot of folks uh, were getting married. It was uh, some kind of effect of the pandemic and being locked in in our houses um, and uh, maybe just the, the thought of life in general and, and, uh, and, and that we're not necessarily promised tomorrow. I don't know, but um, yeah, uh, that one probably went either way. If you're locked in the house with someone. <laughs> you know. That's true. That's true. Maybe the divorce rates also uh, <laughs> gone up. So either one is extremely expensive. And I would say that improves the services. Um, that's right. Goods too. I mean, when it comes to weddings, uh, but uh, I know that I spent probably more than I've ever spent in my entire life last year. So 
Um, but as you know, these are cycles and, and a lot of, I, I also think that people might have said, well, um, you know, we were, we were locked in our homes for two years. Let's go um, to Disney World and, and yet, but they're not going to necessarily go to Disney World every single year, right? I mean, it, right. it may have been, a, let's really make up for the fact that we haven't had these vacations um, and they've spent more in 2021 and maybe that spending might slow down some. We'll have to see. But um, uh, yeah, uh, so thank you. I, and I think, uh, you know, this next slide really kind of takes some of that data and helps us with, um, you know, as we as we talk about the economy in general, um, it, you know, with consumers deleveraging since the financial crisis, we can see that consumers are in a pretty healthy state, right? I mean, they, they have um, the ability to potentially weather uh, some economic difficulties because of their um, uh, healthier balance sheets. Yeah, so um, this is really important. If you look, what this slide is basically showing you is the blue bars, the debt to service ratio, that measures the, the total amount of household debt versus income. And so you can see, you know, after 2008, it just steadily declined. People were paying off their debts, paying off their loans. They were, weren't maybe taking out as much um, debt. And, and so you can see that that number is very low. And although it, it's, you know, maybe starting to creep back up, it's still at very, very low levels. The orange line uh, basically shows you the ability of people to pay their debt payments. So that's um, debt payments. So think your mortgage or your credit card payment versus your income. And you can see that that has, um, that has come down, but still remains very, very high. So th the idea here is that the consumer, um, although you, you're probably hearing that there's been a, an uptick in, um, in consumer debt that's been taking on, but it's starting from a very low level. And that's the key, is the consumer is still very healthy. The balance sheet is very healthy of the consumer, the ability to pay the debt that they're taking on. Um, and the, the other key component to this, which isn't uh, shown here, is that um, the excess savings of consumers is basically at all time high. So if you if you look back through COVID, um, due to uh, government stimulus payments and the inability really just to spend on anything, so people were saving at very, very high rates and ex excess savings or kind of cash in the bank account went up by like $2 trillion. We really have barely seen that come down at all. So when, when we think about the ability to spend and continue to spend, it's still there. Um, now, of course, higher rates on things like credit cards and mortgages makes it a little bit more difficult, but we think in the US, the consumer um, still has a, a pretty big cushion to be able to continue to spend. And that could help us. I mean, if we, if we did see a recession, for example, um, where there was enough economic slowdown to, to call it a recession, uh, then um, if we've got a, a, decent, a decently uh, strong consumer, sometimes that can lessen the blow of a recession as folks see deals, uh, maybe they see housing prices come down some, maybe, maybe the Fed comes in and, and lowers rates or, or you know, there's opportunities out there in a recession that might not be there um, otherwise. And having, having some cash can, can help lessen the blow of that recession, I think. Um, so yeah, great. And, and then um, the other, the other uh, slide here that I think is really helpful as, as we try to kind of frame the, the economic picture is uh, that the business backlogs, you know, the business backlogs, have, it's been a, a story since the pandemic. There's just backlogs. You call your, your I just recently called my uh, uh, lawn mower mechanic, the guys that, that fix my, uh, my mower uh, and I needed it fixed again. It seems like it's happened a few times recently. I must, uh, I must be doing something wrong, but, uh, uh, you know, can't get a part, right? And, and, but, but yet we have seen that improve, right? Yeah, so, and this is really important. So now we're talking about inflation, right? So we've obviously had um, really high inflation this year. I think, you know, uh, people were hoping that maybe it would start to roll over. It, it hasn't, it has a little bit, but we haven't seen a very st strong trend of that yet. But a big part of that, yes, part of it is, is that people had more money in their pockets and the, the increase in demand, um, you know, potentially pushes prices higher. But the reason that that happens is because the supply isn't there. And when you have the supply demand uh, imbalance, that's what, that's what causes prices to move higher. And on the supply side, this is what this this um, this chart is showing you this big spike up in 2020 was because you had the global economy basically shut down. So places like China, which supply a lot of global goods, 
um, were shut down all their ports, right? And so it was hard to get anything. If you were tried to order a washing machine or a couch or something, it might take a year for you to get that, which is crazy. Um, not to mention that we had labor shortages basically around the world. And so even if stuff got here, then it was was you know hard to unload it and get it onto trucks and get it places. And so that that's really been what's making the inflation very sticky is the supply side. Um, but we've started to see that roll over. And that's really good news. So you can see those lines coming down. The sort of um, time that it takes for delivery or the, the, the order backlog is a reflection of that too, right? How much stuff is, is sort of in the backlog that needs to get delivered. That's really starting to loosen and come down. And as China, you know, one of the reasons was China was, was approached COVID differently than most of the world. They had a very strict sort of draconian um, zero COVID policy where when there was any sort of case that popped up, they just shut everything down. Um, that's starting to loosen a little bit, right? And so as that happens, that's really good for the global supply chain. Not to mention, we've also uh, invested in, in manufacturing here in the US. Um, we're, we're bringing some semiconductor production here. That should help. Um, and companies have had now a, a year plus to figure out different supply chain options, right? So you had some companies that went to Latin America or maybe even just went over to Vietnam or something like that. And so they're, they're able to figure some of this out. And so we should continue to see that that improve and that should really help the inflation side of the story. Yeah, and, and this next slide really illustrates that as we, we see um, in, in the blue line, the New York Fed supply chain pressure index, uh, which is just that. I mean, it's the, 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 the way that um, the New York Fed um, really tracks the supply chain issues that are out there and see how the, C, the CPI, which is core uh, inflation, uh, you know, tracks very closely along with the supply chain pressure index um, lagging four months. So, so you can see that there's a potential for inflation to really, really fall. Now, granted, this slide, I believe, was uh, created uh, June 30th, and we have seen since then inflation tick down some, but there's potential for more of that, I believe. Yeah, definitely. Um, you're right. We, we saw we had a, 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 the first sort of flat inflation print, or if you even peeled back, back the onion, some of the core stuff came down, which was really good to see. But yeah, this is basically showing you that it tracks pretty closely to, to the supply chain issues. And if you look at that blue line, you can see that it spiked in 2020. It came back down sort of at the end of 2020, early 2021. And that was a reflection of, you know, before we, we got into Omicron, right? It was sort of like, we thought maybe we were out of COVID and things were loosening back up. But then we got these this new variant that came in and just sort of completely changed the game, right? Cases spiked, just went crazy. And so then the supply chain issues all came roaring back. But we're now seeing that roll over. You know, COVID, knock on wood, is um, probably something we're going to have to live with, but hopefully not in, in the way that we had. And so, yeah, I think you can expect um, with, with pretty good confidence that we will continue to see inflation come down as the supply chain continues to ease. It's good news. That's, yeah. that's really good news. So. Um, all right, so let's let's dive into a discussion on on stocks in general. Of course, the, the economy is the is is what really drives the stock market over long periods of time. Um, we believe stocks. We we do have an outlook that that stocks will face a number of headwinds in the second half of the year, but the amount of turbulence there I go again uh, will likely depend on the actual pace at which inflation falls. It's tough to see the bull case through the cloud cover right now and volatility may persist, but an improved macroeconomic out environment may set the stage for higher valuations. This next slide really um, kind of illustrates that. So inflation, inflation really impacts uh, the outlook that investors have on stocks and, and what they're willing to pay for stocks which in turn affects the price of stocks, right? So um, when you look at this chart, you can see you know, from 1962 to 2022, um, you know, based on where inflation is, uh, is uh, a pretty, you know, this is the, um, the average S&P 500 price to earnings ratio. So the price to earnings or the, or the, um, the, the what, what investors are willing to pay for that amount of earnings in an S&P 500 company. Um, and of course, we're talking about the broad index. But, um, but you can see it, inflation certainly can bring, can put pressure, downward pressure on stock prices. Uh, so what happens with inflation is, is critical. 
Um, and uh, of course, we know as we've been meeting with clients and doing forecasts and projections for retirement and for you know being able to um, have you know ongoing needs met in retirement. You know the income that you need, the the portfolio growth that you need, so that you can leave a legacy to your family as you want to. All of these things, inflation is the biggest wild card. So. Um, um, you know, we, we do expect inflation to come down by year end some, maybe maybe another uh, point and a half. Uh, the latest reading for the Fed's preferred inflation measure, which is the core uh, personal consumption expenditure index, uh, ex excluding food and energy for June was 4.8%. Um, and so I think it's been hovering 4.7, 4.9, 4.8, right in there. Um, lower inflation tends to bring higher valuations. Uh, and as we can see on the chart there, the market clearly does not expect 8% inflation to persist based on current stock prices. So the market is kind of pricing in that, that inflation will settle back down some. Uh, but whether inflation eventually settles at 2 3 or 4% will go a long way toward determining how much higher stock valuations can go from the current levels. Uh, James, what is uh, Natixis's outlook for inflation in the months ahead? Yeah, I, I think... Um... You know, if if we're being honest, we probably thought it was going to start to roll over a little bit sooner, um, but we are seeing it roll over, and we think it will continue to steadily drop um, as we head in, into into the end of the year and into next year. Um, and let's let's also remember that the the Federal Reserve Bank is trying to make that happen, right? So we're not just sitting here relying on things solving themselves. The, the Fed is raising interest rates and trying to tighten um, uh, financial conditions. To bring that down the demand side of the equation. Now they have a, a bit of a, a a small eye to try to thread uh, the needle, um, but we think they can do it. And um, we think that you know inflation probably as we come into next year will will get down around that you know three to four percent, and then as we get move move further into the year, hopefully settle down somewhere in that that two to three percent range that the Fed is looking for. Um, it's going to depend on a lot of things, right? We've still got a war going on in Ukraine. We've still got China um, basically coming out of out of COVID. Um, but the the data certainly looks like we're heading that direction. And so we, we feel pretty good about that. So, uh, you know, that brings us to a discussion on our forecast on stocks, right? I mean, it's uh, it's important to at least put a put a goal out there, put a prediction out there, I think, for investors. And uh, obviously, we can be very wrong, but uh, certainly we we try to use the data that we're given and and convey a, a message that is um, as accurate as possible, given, given what we know now. Uh, earnings uh, estimates appear conservative. So um, our earnings estimates uh, uh, currently are, uh, well, of course, we've seen a roughly 10% increase in the earnings per share uh, in the first quarter. We saw 6.7% uh, increase in the second quarter. Uh, we've recently seen retail reports uh, even last week, uh, show that the U.S. consumer is still strong. We saw credit card spending and things like that earlier in, in the in the um, pod, in the webinar here. Um, almost said podcast. We are also doing a podcast, so if you're interested in that, let us know. We can get that information to you. Uh, but uh, U.S. consumer was still strong in the second quarter. There's still speculation that consumers could slow their spending in the second half of the year. Um, I know I'm trying to cut my spending a little bit after last year. <laughs> Uh, spending maybe a little too much, and maybe there's some other folks out there that are doing that, so that can certainly affect things. Uh, we do believe, even if things are slowing, though, that corporate America could potentially grow S&P 500 earnings per share by 8% in 2022. Right now, we're, we're averaging between the first and second quarter about that, um, so that would put us up around $225 per share. That forecast is still about $5 below the consensus estimate and potentially conservative. Our forecast for 2023 is 235 per share, uh, which would be about a mid single digit increase over our 2022 forecast, which is about $16 below the consensus estimate um, of 251. So uh, what do you think, uh, uh, Mr. Natixis, uh, yeah. Mr. Kelly, what, do you, what are you guys calling for? So yeah, I think we're, we're fairly in line with this, which is to say that um, if we can continue to have high nominal GDP growth, right? We talked about that. Um, if, if first of all, if real GDP growth isn't 
is bad, maybe as as um, as is feared. And then if in, in, you know you add inflation on top of that, it's pretty easy to get to that high single digit nominal GDP number. And that's really what what impacts earnings and revenues, right? And so um, we would expect the U.S. consumer to to stay strong. Again, they, they have the, uh, a, a very healthy balance sheet, the ability to take on more debt if they need to, and a ton of cash still. I remember the um, the Bank of America CEO was was on a few weeks ago. Uh, after their earnings report. And he said, look, the cash balances are the highest I've ever seen them. And people are just spending hand over fist and they've, they've got the money to do it. So even though inflation on a, on a sort of real adjusted basis was eating away at some of the, the, uh, the sort of real wages, people were still actually savings, which means that they were, you know, spending less than what was coming in. It was, it was, it was only about one or 2%, but I think most would expect if you watch the news that people are having to eat away at their at their savings, and in reality, people are actually adding to it. So I think that you know where LPL's at and their their earnings expectations in this this data here um, of S and P at forty three to forty four hundred, which is another you know probably three or four uh, percent from where we are, or even higher maybe now, um, is is fair. I think that the you know we're cautiously optimistic. There are certainly some risks still out there that are unresolved. Um, you know, but in the U.S., we feel pretty good. It's probably a different story abroad. Europe's got some bigger fish to fry and things to deal with. Um, but I think this is this is a uh, you know probably pretty much right in line with where we would be at. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll throw a curveball at you. Um, I, I think you guys are are moving maybe a little bit out of away from value and maybe a tad bit more towards growth. And, and could you uh, could you share your thinking behind that? Yeah, sure. So this is um, this is an important one because I think it tends to be misunderstood. A lot of people have this idea in their head that that value is defensive, and if we're in a slowing economic regime, that that's when then when uh, value should do well. But in reality, um, growth actually tends to to perform better in slowing economic regimes. So if GDP growth is coming down, now that's not you know if we're in a in a 2008 or a deep recession that doesn't hold because everything gets sold off. But when you're when your economic growth is slowing, investors tend to pay a premium for corporate growth. So when you have a, a tech company or something that shows better revenue and earnings growth, if it's hard to find growth in the economy at large, investors will will sort of flock to those growthy names, right? So it's a scarcity principle. The other um, side of it, not to get too too um, technical about it, is that technology and growth tends to behave kind of like a long maturity bond um, with its relationship to interest rates. And if uh, growth is, is slowing and interest rates are sort of anchored on the long end, that tends to be a good um, uh, environment for growth as well. So we're not necessarily going real overweight growth, but we're certainly coming back to, to even weight to adding a little bit more growth in our portfolio. Um, plus it's been so beaten up where, you know, we're trying to be um, uh, value hunters in the growth space too. Yeah, if growth stocks come down far enough, they become value stocks. That's right. right. <laughs> so, uh, and certainly, um, we're always looking for value. Uh, so, just for folks who may be wondering that, um, uh, value some of the stocks that are trading higher multiples at higher multiples uh, for earnings doesn't necessarily mean they're not on sale or they're not a good value. Um, if their earnings are growing rapidly enough and, uh, and they have the ability to um, prove, prove that value uh, over, over the coming years, then that may be the best value stock that you could buy, even though it's technically in the growth category. So if you, if you want more information about that, see us. We're happy to try to explain that better. Um, it's, it, that's certainly a concept that will will um, sometimes just make me scratch my head and think, well, okay, there's got to be a better way of describing these, <laughs> these companies. But, um, uh, but certainly, yes, it, it is interesting to see that Natixis and some of our other managers are starting to recommend growth um, in the portfolios when they, when they hadn't earlier this year. So uh, let's, let's talk about bonds quickly. Um, we're just about out of time, but I want to, I want to give us an opportunity to talk about the bond market. Of course, bond market, why own bonds? I mean, especially this year, it's like, you know, why did we own these things? Why did we buy these things? Well, the point of bonds is, is uh, diversification. Um, we don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. Uh, positive total returns to portfolios over time. 
because they tend to act as a um, uh, non-correlated asset class to stocks. So stocks go down, bonds can go up in some, in some cases. Uh, unfortunately, none of the real reasons that we own bonds have proven to be true this year. Um, and, and none of the, the value of bonds is, is, is true all the time. I mean, there's certainly times when they don't do what they're supposed to do. So uh, in our clients' portfolios, we had trimmed fixed income toward the end of the year last year, and uh, we had shortened up duration. But still, uh, having, having a sliver of bonds in your portfolio begs the question, why did we own these? Um, because we just went through really the worst bond market sell-off that, that I've seen in my career, uh, possibly, what, 30 or 40 years, James? What do you think? Yeah, the I think the the drawdown in the the aggregate bond index was the worst in history this year. Wow. So it was down like twelve percent at one point. Wow. Yeah. So not acting like bonds. No. Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, so what do you think now though? I mean, we we have to be careful as investors not to look in the rearview mirror. Uh, you know the the idea of of you know if I if I had this money today to invest. Uh, what would I do with it? It's always important. You know, um, you know ask yourself the question, um, if I had this all in cash, uh, would I go out and buy the portfolio that I own now? If the answer is no, then maybe maybe it's not the portfolio we sh you should be in. So think about that from that perspective. What today, knowing what we know today, are bonds a good deal? Yeah. So um, the good news is that bonds are a great deal now, <laughs> you know, you, but, um, but I think, so I think there's a few important things here. One is that if you hadn't had any bonds in your portfolio and you were all equities, there's a good chance you might've owned um, some more uh, NASDAQ technology, those kinds of things. And that stuff dropped 25, 30%. And so the, the, the reason that you own bonds is so that when something like that happens, you don't pick up the phone and call Matt and say, go to cash. Because if you do that, then it's your your chances of recovering and 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 sticking to your longer term plan it all just goes out the window. So bonds are really in there to to be a a backstop to equity. And yes, this year they they dropped pretty precipitously as rates rose. Right, inflation is like public enemy number one for bonds because those fixed payments become worth less over time as you have inflation. The good news is that um, now actually since we've had such a big sell off, yields have moved way higher. So there's much more value in bonds. You can get a, a two-year uh, treasury bill for, you, you can get 3%, right? Which, you know, a year, year and a half ago, that was less than 1%. So we've yeah, had this big move. I just got 3.1% on a one-year treasury for, for, for someone. It, it, isn't that crazy? I mean, it's amazing. Never... And there's, there's no risk in that, right? It's backed by the, by the U.S. military, basically. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that, so, so number one, yields have come way up. So there is way more opportunity in bonds now. And that's great because it'll provide income. And what we've seen recently, since since really what was driving the sell-off was the inflation fears, right? And rates rising. Um, as we've moved more into questions about the economic regime, bonds have started to behave more like bonds. So um, correlations have, have gone back towards uh, uh, negative with equities. Yeah, so this slide is just showing you um, how high yields have come. So, um, the uh, the the median yield is that that orange bar, right? Um, if if you think about over a long term, what you typically would get out of a yield uh, out of a bond, and that blue bar is the range that we've seen. We're right at the top of the range, so you're 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 getting paid much higher yields for basically than we've had in the last fifteen years or so. Um, so you know, for for forty years, it was easy to buy a bond and rates went down and think you were going to make four, five, six percent. Um, that all came crashing down at the beginning of this year and, and really before that. But now you can get that again, potentially. So I think it's important you, you have that in the portfolio for income, but also to the correlation aspect. We're now starting to see bonds trade um, with negative or, or much lower correlations to equities. That really provides that ballast for you in your portfolio. Is there any particular area of the bond market that you, you, see, you see great value? Yeah. So I think still in that sort of short uh, end of the yield curve, like we were just talking about in treasuries. If you think, if you were to picture the yield curve in your head, it sort of spikes up and then it flattens out or it even inverts a little bit. And so right where that spike is, the elbow, I call it, I think is where there's a ton of value that that two-year treasury at 3.1% is more than you can get out of a, out of a 10-year bond. 
And so what's good about that is then you don't have to extend out and, and take on more interest rate risk, right? Um, so I think eventually the curve will normalize. And so that's, and that's what's going to do great. Additionally, we've seen credit um, widen out, and meaning that you're getting paid more on yields. Um, and and you can you can you know investment grade credit high yield things like that are are paying you um, fairly handsomely right now. So I think it's 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 fairly uniform. The one area of the bond market that I think you want to maybe maybe avoid a little bit is the mortgage back sector, um, and that's really just because the Fed is going to be actively selling those. Um, and as we've seen rates move higher, um, there's an interesting dynamic with mortgages that um, obviously when rates move lower, everybody runs and refinances. When rates move higher, nobody refinances, right? You wouldn't refinance into a higher interest rate. And that actually extends out the, the uh, real sort of maturity of that bond. So we're kind of avoiding that area. But um, but yeah, overall, there's there's a lot of opportunity. And this is showing you that, um, you know, we saw, if you look all the way over to the right of the graph, you can see that spike up in the blue lines. That was bonds and stocks, yeah, the correlations, meaning... Um, the way that they moved in relation to each other went way higher than it typically does. And so stocks were selling off and bonds were selling off, right? Which is almost never happens, very rarely happens. You can see the majority of these, this, these blue lines are below, right? Are negative, meaning when stocks sell off, bonds go up. Um, so it's painful when they both go down at the same time. But if you squint, you can see at the bottom there that we're actually back into negative territory recently. <laughs> um, and so we would expect that trend to continue. Um, and yeah, it was painful at the beginning of this year, but I think going forward, you're going to get much more utility out of your bonds and with the added bonus or benefit that you actually can get a pretty good yield now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm looking back here at 2008, uh, see, see these, uh, you know, in, in this time period here where, where stocks and bonds really, really kind of moved together. I remember, I remember, uh, that being, uh, an anomaly back then and, uh, and here we've seen it again. So. Uh, it doesn't all, you know, it's, it's not normal. <laughs> so yeah. hang in there. And, uh, and I think you'll find that, that the bonds will be doing their job again um, soon. So uh, yeah. And so quickly, just a quick, uh, we're going to touch on policy. Um, and I think this can be helpful just because we are in a midterm election year. And um, thank you for that insight on, on the stock and bond market, uh, James. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting that that um, in the in the midterm election year, um, uh, you know, so much so much of the focus, I think, on the economy and on the um, uh, stock market and on the bond market, all these different things is is also intertwined with policy and even the elections and even politics, right? So um, it's it's hard to have a conversation with a client, um, a meeting with a client where politics doesn't come up. Uh, so that tells me that there might be something of, of a reversal when we when we get past the midterm election. And so that's this is what you see here. Uh, stocks have gained a year after midterms every time. Uh, and so that's going all the way back to 1950 uh, and using the S&P 500 stock index, uh, which was actually launched in 1957. But you can see uh, performance back to 1950 incorporates the prede predecessor index of the S&P 90. But the point of this is that after we get past that midterm election, stocks tip, you know, have done very well. Uh, and, um, and so since 1900, the president's party uh, has lost house seats in midterms 87% of the time, averaging 30 seats lost. Uh, of course, all house seats are up for reelection in the midterms. In the Senate, where only about a third of seats are up for grabs, the president's party has lost 67% of the time with an average loss of three seats. More recently, losses have been more extreme with President Obama losing 63 seats and President Trump losing 41. The only president to add seats in recent times is George W. Bush riding a wave of support after 9-11 when the Republicans added eight seats in that midterm. Uh, Democrats would have a difficult path to hold their current slim majorities in the House and Senate if they were only facing historical trends. Add in President Biden's low approval rating, which correlates with midterm performance and weak consumer confidence due to high inflation and the odds heavily favor Republicans taking the House. Republicans seem to be moderate favorites in the Senate. The makeup of seats for 
up for re-election favors Democrats with 21 Republicans up for re-election in November compared with only 14 Democrats. But genuine toss-up seats are more evenly matched and Republicans only need to flip one seat to become the majority party in the Senate. So what do you think, uh, James? Uh, get past midterms and you think that might be good for stocks? Yeah, so it almost always is. And, and, the, and the reason is... Um, you know, Democrats think if they have complete control, things will be better. Republicans think if they have complete control, things will be better. In reality, typically a split is what's best for the market. But in any case, typically the market um, does well after midterms because that uncertainty gets removed. That sort of risk premium that gets priced in um, from the uncertainty side of things gets removed. And there's a lot of I mean, I can just tell you firsthand um, talking to advisors like like Matt um, that there's a lot of, of people who say, you know what, I'm just going to go conservative, wait for the for the election season to pass, and then I'll I'll reassess and probably get back in, right? And that's kind of a general feeling. And so I think that you know what what we tend to see is that um, no matter what happens, <laughs> that it tends to be a pretty good, um, you know, if you think about the progression of the year in a midterm, you typically have a pretty good start. You kind of chop wood over the summer, maybe have some weakness, and then after the election, you tend to do very well. Um, and it really doesn't have anything to do with which party gains or loses or anything like that. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and you know, it, it, I think that when you look at the numbers, they just bear out. I mean, uh, the S&P 500 has been higher a year after every midterm since 1950. Uh, that's 18 out of 18 years uh, with the average gain a year later, 14.5 percent. Um, breaking it down by presidential party doesn't show much difference, 14.8% under a Republican and 145 under a Democrat. So, um, you know, again, uncertainty is removed. And uh, generally, there's somewhat of a, a balance of power there. And that can be good for stocks. Yep. Looking at the next slide, we see that kind of kind of says generally the same thing here. Um, um, you know, uh, the, the best scenarios, really, uh, historically, uh, have been under a Democrat president um, with Republican control of Congress. Uh, the S&P 500 has been up 16.3% during those years, hard for investors to ignore. Uh, but uh, if Democrats hold on to the Senate but lose the House, the second most, um, uh, that combination has also been quite strong for stocks historically, with the S&P 500 gaining 13.6% percent on average during those years. So uh, just a little bit of history. No way we can tell the future here. We're not trying to tell the future, but um, but history sometimes rhymes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily repeat itself sometimes. Is that Mark Twain? Everybody says that's Mark yeah, Twain. I think so. Okay. It sounds like it, yeah. <laughs> or Benjamin Franklin or Einstein yeah. or somebody like that. Uh, well, um, that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you so much for spending a Tuesday evening with us uh, talking about the economy, talking about stocks, bonds, uh, numbers, and, and things that we think are interesting. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting. Um, how, to, how to reach us? Um, you know, uh, there's just a, a, a link typically. Well, hopefully, I, well, not hopefully, definitely. Kimberly will put that link in the comments section. I don't take care of any of that stuff, but she's great at it. So uh, look for the link to reach out to us in the comments section of the video. Um, also, um, we uh, we can always uh, be reached by phone at 336-231-6844. Uh, never a charge for first consultation. If you'd like to get a second opinion on your portfolio, if you're if you're not a if you're not a client of ours and you want to just talk for the first time, sit down, have a have a conversation, get to know each other, you know, find out if if we're a good fit and. Um, and then, of course, visit our website at canon-wealth.com. Uh, and James, thank you. This has been great. I know you had a lot of things you could have been doing this evening, but uh, really appreciate your insights. Uh, any any parting words for us? I, I Thanks for having me, Matt. Um, this is great. I think it's important to talk about this stuff. And I would just say, overall, we're in uncertain times, yes, and there's some volatility, but the, but the key is to stay invested. It's, it's time in the market, not timing the market. If you, if you uh, panic and get out, you're unlikely to get back in in time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, reach out. Don't hesitate. We're happy to help you um, any way we can. We also have, of course, relationship with, with tax people here. So if you have tax questions here at the end of the year, I'm happy to talk with you there too. So again, Matt Hearn, Cannon Wealth Management, signing off. Hope you have a great evening and uh, 
Stay safe out there.